Uh, and, and I request the students to extend a warm welcome to the officers of the Judicial Academy who are joining us today. And um, we're going to begin with the price distribution as we promised every day. So can I ask Shivaraman to come up and take his. I, I welcome the officers of the Judicial Academy to this lecture by Justice John McMinnon and since this is the first time they are attending the lecture and the rest of you know the resume, uh, please put up with me for two minutes while I introduce the speaker to our guests. Justice John McMinnon is a judge of the Irish Supreme Court. As a student, he was a council member of the Free Legal Aid Centre and was involved in running a centre in Ballyfermer. He qualified as a barrister in, in King's Inn in 1975 and was called to the bar that year. He was called to the inner bar in 1991 and engaged in general practice specializing in judicial review work. He appeared and acted for a number of clients before the Flat Mahan Tribunal and acted for the Department of Health and members of the Den Cabinet including the Tayosich, if I have got that right, before the Ryan Tribunal. Tishe. Okay, thank you. He was a legal assessor to the fitness, uh, fitness to practice committee of the Medical Council for 10 years. Having served on the Bar Council for four terms, he was elected chairman serving from 1997 to 1999. He was a director of the VHI from 1995 to 1997. What is the VHI? VHI. This is, this is a private insurance run by the state. Since his appointment to the bench in 2004, he has dealt primarily with judicial review matters. He was appointed a member of the Special Criminal Court in 2009. Since his appointment, he has decided a number of cases with a human rights dimension, addressing issues as to the rights of asylum seekers, children in need of special care, treatment of prisoners, and unmarried fathers. He has published a number of papers and contributed to seminars, especially with regard to family law and the law of children. He delivered the National University of Ireland Garrett Fitzgerald Memorial Lecture in 2014, dealing with how the Court of Justice of the European Union, in fact, in large part, created the European Union in a remarkable series of judgments and has spoken on the politicization of the judicial role in the context of the EU. And this is something that we are going to be touching upon in our lecture today, that we have started the course with looking at the significance of comparative constitutional law and the question of whether comparative constitutional law has any resonance when we are interpreting national constitutions. And so should constitutions be interpreted only in terms of their text and their identity or should constitutions be interpreted in terms of certain universal values. And one of the dimensions of this, as he wants to project as an issue that we should all be concerned with, is what has happened in the European Union, and perhaps leading to certain, certain political consequences in, in Europe as well, which has a resonance with us when we're talking about interpreting our national constitutions. He has written an essay about the Irish directives of social policy, and their connection with the European Charter principles in a festive for Niall Fennelly of the Supreme Court of Ireland. He was an advisor to the Prime Minister and several leaders of the main opposition party and has acted for a number of ministers including the Irish Prime Minister before one tribunal. He was a member of the Special Criminal Court for three years dealing with political terrorism cases. He has also dealt with children at risk from drugs, prostitution or otherwise he has retired as Ireland's representative on the Consultative Council of European Judges for five years. As a, as a legal student, he was involved in the Free Legal Aid Advice Centres, a student organisation which gave advice to disadvantaged people on a voluntary basis. One of the cases which he decided when he was a High Court judge 
played a role in bringing about a constitutional amendment in Ireland, entrenching the rights of children to have all court decisions made with their welfare as a paramount consideration. We are very honored to have Justice McMillan speak to us. But before I invite him to address us, I thought maybe we should have a small introduction for the purpose of our guests about what is it that we are doing in this course on comparative constitutional law. So the course on comparative constitutional law is exploring primarily the interconnections between Ireland and India. And these interconnections are, we are, we are exploring these interconnections in terms of both of them be both countries having been under colonial rule and having fought colonial rule and the shared political and historical values that these two countries may have. And in this context, what is, what is the relevance of this shared history that we have to constitutional interpretation? That's, that's the primary uh, area that we are, we are spending over a week. He, he's, he's teaching with us for over a week. He started from Monday and he will go on till Sunday. And today's lecture primarily focuses on the question of judicial review and the limitations, if we might say so, on judicial review. So the, the question that we ended with yesterday was given that there are so many problems with a purposive interpretation, primarily being that when you talk about purposive interpretation, you, you don't know the sources from which you're beginning your interpretation. And so is the alternative, that is a textual interpretation, really the solution to all our problems? And after the discussion yesterday, and perhaps we will begin with that, with that uh, introduction, that is textual interpretation really textual at all? And when we say textual, what exactly do we mean when we are saying textual? When we are saying textual, are we saying that a text automatically speaks to the judge? Or ultimately the judge has to read something into the text? And when the judge is reading into the text, what is the judge reading into the text from? And when we say that the judge is reading into the text, then doesn't it actually really become purposive interpretation rather than merely stay as a textual interpretation, whether one wants to call it strict interpretation or one wants to call it by any other name. So what we're doing today, and we'll perhaps do it, uh, and I will come, come in later to respond to what, must, what Justice McMillan will say, but the real question that we want you to think about is, are there problems with a purposive interpretation? So though we are starting with a presentation on purposive interpretation, I think what we want you to engage with is also that it is a very attractive interpretative theory, but what are the difficulties with this theory and are they really difficulties or are they opportunities that we need to engage with? Uh, with these few words, I will invite Justice McMillan to speak and I will come back and respond later. Thank you very much, Professor Vasanti. Can you all hear me up at the back? Everything, can you hear me? If you hear me, if you can hear me, just wave your hands a little bit. Okay, everyone, everyone can hear me, good. Um, you're all very welcome. I'm glad you've all come here to get out of the rain. And uh, it's a, an unseasonable day for going to lectures. And thank you very much for coming back again. Um, welcome too to my judicial colleagues uh, we're, and also to all my fellow law students because what we're embarked on here is a form of a voyage of discovery where we look at the question of interpretation of constitutions. And at first sight, as we've discussed earlier in the series, the idea of constitutional interpretation makes the blood run cold. Could there be anything more boring to talk about than how you interpret constitutions? But the other side of the equation is, as we've discovered as we've gone through these lectures, that it's, a, it's an extremely important subject. It can affect the outcome of cases. And the way judges interpret constitutions can affect not only a particular case, but the ethos and nature of a society which will be shaped by those, by those uh, interpretations. 
Hitherto, for example, we discussed yesterday the textual analysis which was engaged in by members of the Supreme Court of the United States. And for one example we can take there of textual analysis was the right to bear arms. It also shows the strength and weakness of textual analysis because it demonstrates that textual analysis does not in itself dictate that there will necessarily be one outcome. It can work in two different ways. It can arrive, one can arrive at a quote liberal outcome, if you want to use those la labels, which are sometimes helpful, and it can sometimes arrive at a conservative outcome. If you, can find it, if you combine it with originalism, that is going back to the intention of the founders of the Constitution, the framers of the Constitution, well then, in the United States, it can give rise to, and likely to give rise to, a rather more history-based proposition. But the difficulty is, what is history? What is legal history? When you look to the intention of the framers or the intention of the ratifiers of the United States Constitution. It's a different, as somebody commented to me yesterday after the lecture, uh, it's a different proposition in India where the entire volumes of the deliberations of the Constituent Assembly are available and therefore courts can have resort to them and see what co contributions were made and what the intent of the, le of the consti con Constitution makers was. It's there to see. By way of distinction in the United States, the Constitution makers took care to ensure that such records were not available and were not capable of being resorted to. Knowing as they did that constitutions are ambiguous, sometimes state general principles sometimes, and also have, must, in certain circumstances, be capable of interpretation in the light of changed circumstances. That was their wisdom, and they were right in doing this. The other side of the equation, however, is that there are schools of thought where in the United States and elsewhere where people adopt hard and fast approaches to the question of interpretation. And as well as, uh, if, you, if you're aware of any discipline where there is imperfect knowledge, whether it be law or medicine or schools of thought about particular medical approaches, that can lead to extremely dogmatic approaches even though the information which is available is imperfect. Today, we're going to talk about the question of purpose of interpretation, broad interpretation, what's called teleological interpretation. That means going back to the origins or the, or the source of our purpose of the, of, of, of the document which, is, which you seek to interpret. Last night, I was looking at a moth. And the moth was just going through the window of, or at the window of my bedroom. It went from the window because there was a light outside, and then it went over towards a light beside the bed, just like that fly there. And it struck me that that was a good metaphor for teleological approaches. Because when judges resort to the spirit of a constitution, on the one hand, it can be immensely tempting, like the moth, it can lead, if you find the light, it can lead to freedom. But on the other hand, it can lead to very bad results if the, if the moth happens to come too close to a light or a bulb. My thesis today is I am advancing the cause of uh, a purpose of interpretation, and later in our discussions, we will explore the pluses and minuses of such an approach. When we speak of the spirit of a constitution, what do we mean? Uh, when we speak of identity, what do we mean? Are we talking about something unique to each constitution? And if you look at our two flags here, for those of you who have been here all week, the remarkable resemblance between our two flags is, is a kind of starting point, not because one is derived from the other, they weren't, but because they're both indicators or symbols of our identity. And they are both referred to in our respective constitutions, and they are both part 
both of the identity and the spirit of the Constitution. A Constitution, it seems to me, can be seen as being an indication of identity, both internally to the state and externally. The Constitution speaks to the people of India. The, our Constitution in Ireland speaks to the we, the people of Ireland. And the preambles of constitutions, as you'll see there, both contain very, very similar ideas. The Irish Constitution obviously has, as a reflection of the ideology of the Irish state in the 1930s, a strong Roman Catholic religious uh, ethos. The Indian Constitution, it, the preamble there, is, is somewhat different, reflecting the values which uh, inhere in the Union of India. The, in both of these, I think, you can look at the spirit, uh, and then after that, if you go to something like the Directive Principles, and for our new, new colleagues, our constitution in Ireland and the constitution of India share the characteristic of both having Directive Principles of Social Policy, and therefore their sister constitutions in that way. They have a, a strong affinity. Um, if you look at that, you, you begin to get an an idea of what I think is the spirit of a constitution. Because the spirit of a constitution isn't simply, to my mind, an assertion of nationality, but also a, a, an identification of the form of ethos or values which are to inhere in a society and which are to be applied to citizens. So what does it do? What does the preamble to the Indian constitution do? It talks about we, the people. It talks, uh, reflecting, uh, as both our constitutions do, the, the values of the French Constitution of 1789, the, the direct declaration, which talked about the entitlement of people. We, the people. Indians, we are entitled to enact our own constitution. Irish people, we are entitled to enact our own constitution. And it's quite different, obviously, from the idea of a constitution being enacted by uh, are given validity by the crown or by a king or an emperor. It's an exercise in sovereignty, popular sovereignty. So the, I think also that constitutions must be looked at, not only as speaking to the present, but also as in the case of the preambles which we looked at a moment ago, invoking the spirit of the past in order to give legitimacy to the very question of the enactment of the Constitution itself. Why are these things all relevant? Because for judges, for example, because constitutions influence the entire fabric and framework of the law in which we operate and also will influence ultimately at whatever court level the way in which the, the statute law is, inter is interpreted and applied. So, what I should point out, therefore, is for the purpose of this lecture, I'm being the good policeman, and Professor Vasanti is being the textual bad policeman. I'm talking about the advantages and the benefits which can accrue by resorting to the spirit behind the Constitution, the idea of a law which is antecedent to the, the words of the Constitution. And she, on the other hand, is going to talk about the detriments and the, the risks which inhere in that. The moth either can escape to the light or may come close to the bulb and, and die. What binds citizens, it seems to me, in all countries governed by constitution, is not only the words of that constitution itself, but the manner in which the values which are expressed therein are interpreted afterwards. And we in Ireland and, and India share the process of interpretation by the courts. But a constitution, and this is where I disagree with the originalists and with the textualists, a constitution is not written in stone. There is a constant dialogue between the people, between judges, and between the actual text or words of the Constitution, whether it's American or German or Italian or Indian or, or Irish. And also, it, they contain 
a very important identification of who, who we are, who the Indian people are, who the Indian people in all their diversity are, a, 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 as it were, an umbrella definition to place a definition of India, it seems to me, as, as a unifying factor between all the, the, the state constituent states. So, as we saw earlier, constitutions will undoubtedly have a national flavor or characteristic, and we'll talk about shared values, shared characteristics, um, we'll talk about legitimacy, in other words, that the people say we are entitled to enact a constitution. And it is really, I think, a, co a constitution is an act of con self-conceptualization and realization. That's a very grand, two very grandiose terms. What does that mean? Self-conceptualization means, as I would understand it, that, we, that the people who are enacting the constitution say, we are the people. Uh, realization means that not only are we the people capable of enacting the Constitution, but we are the people who are able to utilize the Constitution going forward. And a Constitution, obviously, as we know, will identify not only the nature of the people, not only the, the structure of the state, the nature of the polity, the nature of the values, the, the question of the relationship between the center and the states, as in the case of India, uh, will contain directive principles and so forth. It's both a dialogue and an action program. And that's particularly so with the Indian Constitution, which is a forward-looking affirmative form of document, which actually contains and contained from the very outset a program of state action, uh, which renders it in many ways unique, I think, compared to any other constitution in the world. For our part in, in Ireland, our situation is more complex. Uh, 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 I'll just explain it very briefly. We're signatories to the, to the treaty, which is the Council of Europe, which means we look to a document called the Conve European Convention on Human Rights, which identifies a series of rights which are very similar to the Bill of Rights in the United States. But more seriously and significantly, in 1972, Ireland became a member of the European Union, and that membership of the European Union had vast consequences for us, both constitutionally, socially, economically. We became 100 times more wealthy, 100 times more wealthy per capita. Our GDP, literally, over 30 years, has gone from, one, say, 1 to 100, and I'm talking in terms of billions. Um, it's brought vast benefits to rural Ireland in agriculture. And as well as that, it has brought a, a revolution in social attitudes. The, the way in which this was done was by a pooling of sovereignty, so that each member of the European Union, uh, if you want to know about Brexit, if anybody raises Brexit in a conversation, what's it all, what's it all about? I'll give you a potted version in one minute. Every member state of the European Union pools sovereignty. It's done bit by bit. What the British did not understand, and many did not understand, is that when you join the European Union, you are not joining a club with fixed rules. You are joining what the Europeans, the European Union called, a project. And the project was to achieve an ever closer union. That's very different from joining a free trade club. And consequently, to put it in one sentence, the diff one of the real bases for Brexit, going back to the very beginning, was the misapprehension on the part of the uh, many, many in Britain uh, regarding what they were getting into. Um, even a, a British negotiator in the 1960s spoke of the uh, amusement which he derived, he, he knew both sides of the question, when he spoke of the fact that when people on the British side talked about joining, they were talking about joining the quote, common market, 
On the other hand, when the French and the Spanish negotiators were talking about it, they spoke about acceding to the treaties. These treaties were the treaties that brought together the states of, of the European Union, and we'll discuss them later. I want to discuss something else which is unique to our two constitutions. For those who weren't here before, the fact that there are affinities between our two constitutions is not a coincidence because going back to the 1880s, 1890s and the foundation of the Congress party, both Nash Irish nationalists and Indian nationalists recognized that there was a commonality of interest and a commonality of identity between us. That, of course, was predicated on, in the first instance on the proposition that my enemy's enemy is my friend, but also went much further because we, had, we discovered that there were strong cultural affinities between ourselves, uh, 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 between each other. In literature, going back hundreds and th indeed thousands of years, we share a, a remarkable number of similarities. But what both constitutions and what, what Congress was looking for and what the Irish nationalist struggle was about was achieving the idea of sovereignty. In Ireland, the dichotomy was between those who were prepared to accede to dominion status and remain, with the crown remaining and those who rejected that proposition entirely and said, we want sovereignty, it should reside with us, the people of Ireland, and nobody else. As a result, the, the, there was a rising, a rebellion in 1916, culminating in a treaty in 1921, a split between those who were in favour and against the treaty thereafter, and subsequent to that, uh, a civil war in Ireland. But the commonality of interest between us is the fact that there is, in our constitution and in the Indian constitution, something very, very important. What's that important thing? Both constitutions are different from the Canadian constitution, from the Australian constitution, from all the other com com Commonwealth uh, constitutions, in that our constitutions, India and Ireland, integrate the ideal of nationhood with the, quest with the reality of the state. And no other constitutions do that in the same way. For those who are here, were not here before, there were the, the Sir Benegal Rao in, engaged in a, 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 a considerable series of, of discussions with the authors of our constitution. And for myself, it's a source of some pride that the author of Directive Principles, uh, John Hearn, was, and Eamon de Valera himself, created a concept, uh, and, I, and I, 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 I do not like the idea of constitutional borrowing, but the idea of the Directive Principles of Social Policy has been used so, so very remarkably in India but was also used by a, a range of other countries, maybe 20 other countries adopted the principle of directive pr principles of social policy and embodied them in their constitution. So, the, what, if, we can ha if, if anyone has a phone, I wouldn't mind having a look at my notes. Uh, 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 has anyone got a, 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 a phone with a, a torch on it? Okay. Oh, that's good, yeah. Okay, thanks. So, in, Indi in the case of India, obviously with its hu huge diversity of people, of states, the it's magic, um, the, math, the math and the life. The, the, with, in India, the question of identity is a much more nuanced one than in Ireland because of the very diversity of the states and identities. I was looking last night at the, the number of different, even when in Indian people are speaking English, the number of different accents there are, just as we have met very many accents in Ireland, even our, in our tiny country. But as Justice Kanna said, constitution, a constitution is a, an embodiment of the national heritage and is, as such is, is a precious thing. It may be that some in the West, the common lawyers, would criticize the way the Indian 
Supreme Court uh, engaged in a process of con constitutional interpretation. But as, as I've sought to uh, explain and express, it seems to me that so many of these ideas depend on context. And it is a quite different thing, as I understand, to be a, a judge facing difficult issues in India <clears throat> as compared to a judge in, in Ireland or in, in Britain. When we look at spirit, we also look at identity. And for those of you who have a moment, if you would mind Googling the German basic law, have a look at it. And you'll see that there are references to uh, the issue of dignity, the issue, uh, the issue of federalism, <coughs> and the issue of free speech. Now, why is that? Because the German constitution was adopted in 1949, subsequent to the Second World War. And what values were denied to, to the people of Germany it, it, during the Nazi period? Well, it was those three values, fundamentally, dignity, which, fa which resulted in so many, the absence of dignity, the absence of a realization of the worth of dignity, and which inheres in every human being, resulted in concentration camps. Freedom of speech, there was a total absence of freedom of speech. And as we were discussing this morning, if a state can control information, if a state restricts free speech, it necessarily restricts the choices which are available and which should be available under a democracy. So those values which you find in the German basic law are fundamental. They are part of the constitutional identity and which are so precious to the Germans that they will, they actually protect that value, those values, even at risk of putting at, to the hazard their membership and adherence to the European Union, because the German Constitutional Court consider it so vital to protect those interests that that is their duty. I want to talk now about something slightly different. Um, how f it, and it goes to the very question of spirit, the spirit of a constitution. And I'm talking about Europe. Um, and I'm talking about the fragility of the rule of law. Because in the 1990s, there was a strong feeling that much had been achieved in Europe, uh, that the Iron Curtain had fallen, and that a new Europe, the new states from the, who were, which were to the east of the Iron Curtain, could join into a new European Union which would create prosperity for all. There was a strong feeling among political scientists that the constitutions in Poland and Hungary were going to be the framework for a new enlightenment in those countries. I take Poland and Hungary as conscious examples for a moment, for, for, for a reason I'll explain in a moment. What the hope was, was that the, these countries would all join the European Union and would share in the prosperity. Uh, the hope was to create a charter, an idea of social rights and entitlements, rather similar to the directives, which would give each citizen of Europe an idea of social benefit as well as identity. That went well until about 2007-2008, where a number of threats or challenges began to face Europe. Firstly, there was the economic recession. Thirdly, secondly, there was the question of migration from Syria and the tragedy of the millions, I say literally millions of people, who died trying to cross the Mediterranean. Um, it's, it, it, it's very, very hard to understand how, what an impact that has had. And as a result of those two twin powerful threats to democracy, things happened in Eastern Europe which nobody thought would happen. The, the, the rule of law which people had considered well embedded 
began to be threatened. And in Hungary, a government was elected which was self-professed as a, an illiberal democracy. And that did things like building a wall between Hungary uh, and neighboring countries to prevent migration. It, it, and furthermore, what happened was that the parliament, where there was a majority, an overwhelming majority of the new, the new, the new populist government, introduced legislation which undermined the Supreme Court of Hungary, dictated who would become judges, and created a situation where the rule of law, which had seemed so well established, disappeared almost within two years. In Poland, similar things happened. And the one common element between these two countries, and for all I know other countries, is that the legitimacy which the states had sought to establish on the basis of what's called output, output legitimacy. In other words, output legitimacy is you'll be better off. Input legitimacy is you're loyal to the state. And the concern is, and was, that the benefits which were supposed to come to citizens as a result of being part of the European Union did not come. And therefore, the loyalty and legitimacy of those states was put at risk. And we now have a situation where there's a constitutional crisis in Poland, uh, where the government has sought in Poland to undermine its Supreme Court by appointing extra members to the court. The previous government didn't co cover itself in glory either because of the fact that it tried to nominate people to its Supreme Court before it left office. Not, not necessarily a clever move either, which justified the new government in taking, a, taking steps to say that that was an illegit illegitimate procedure. The Polish government have introduced rules saying that any voting in the Supreme Court, any judgments, have to be on the basis of a two-thirds majority, and also that they, want more, they wished for and intended to bring an in increased number of judges onto the court. In Hungary, one of the ways in which they undermined legitimacy of the courts was simply by reducing the retirement age, by statute. Not, not so hard to do. Uh, and they also created a series of courts which were, uh, or intend to do, which are administrative courts. Uh, and those courts are, are intended to deal with difficult issues which might involve the interests of the government. So what you do is, you, what the intention is there is to people those new courts with a new cadre of judges, young, enthusiastic, who will be, I'm sure, uh, very appreciative of the fact that they have become judges appointed by the present illiberal democracy. And uh, the effect has been to oust several hundred of the other judges. There's still a dispute, a huge dispute going on in Hungary. Why am I mentioning all this? Because I'm talking about the spirit of constitutions. Constitutions can be undermined. Constitutions can be undermined by a liberal democracy and constitutions can be undermined by a series of events, not always for, at all foreseeable. But the one thing I think that we have to understand and learn from this is legitimacy is not solely to be predicated on the idea of prosperity. Since the emergency, the Indian Supreme Court has itself taken remarkable steps in order to protect constitutional identity. The precursor, of course, as we all know, was in 1973, culminating in Minerva Mills in 1980, which held that the constitution was not to be eviscerated and that the, the fundamental structure was not to be, could not be removed or changed by a constitutional amendment by parliament. I made the point before, I make it again, because I think it's important to understand one of the curious aspects of comparative constitutionalism when we look at other constitutions. We learn big lessons, like what's happened in Poland, what's happened in Hungary. And we also we le we learn maybe other lesser lessons, like the fact 
which was a fact that uh, a guy, an academic called Dietrich Conrad, happened to be in India in 1965. He delivered a lecture about the fundamental structure of the German constitution. A man heard of this, spoke to the uh, council who was involved in one of the, ca one of the cases, and as a result, that was cited, the whole pr principle of basic structure, or fundamental structure of the Indian Constitution was cited to the Supreme Court and relied upon. So, I want to talk very briefly also about the, it seems to me, the, one of the key issues, therefore, to summarize, which were pinpointed by Dr. Embedkar in 1949 in his famous Constituent Assembly speech when he talked about a life of contradictions. Because what he was touching, I'm not going to quote it for you because I'm sure you all know it by heart, but what he was touching on was the dichotomy and the equivalence of and dichotomy between liberty and equality. And as we said yesterday, liberty and equality are not necessarily always forces and values that march together. So what we, what I, sometimes individual liberty can be asserted and can be recognized without any effect on equality. Other times equality can be recognized, but then individual rights may be put at risk and they don't always march hand in hand. So as we know, the Indian Supreme Court gave expression to the idea of basic structure. And it's for that reason that Article 368, as we know, uh, is made subject to the, the fundamental structure of the Constitution. We know all that. And it's going to the question of spirit, it's a little a source of pride to me as an Irish judge that the idea of directives where, uh, has been, can be found in the constitutions of Myanmar, Burma, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, Tanzania, Nigeria, Zanzibar, Ghana, Uganda, Namibia, as well as a number of Pacific Island states, about eight of them, um, all coming from Little Ireland. It's our, it's, it's our constitutional claim to fame, I think. Um, I want to talk now about, very briefly, about the way in which Irish courts have looked at the spirit of the Constitution, and we just look at two quotes from Irish jurisprudence because I think they just represent the issue uh, very well. And the first was from Mr. Justice Henchy in a criminal case where he talked about, if you just look at the entire quote, going down all the way through and uh, to the next part of the quote as well, where he spoke about the letter killeth, but the spirit giveth life. Uh, that was a quotation from the Christian Bible, but I think this is true in every other context. The letter killeth, but the spirit giveth life. It is the spirit that gives life to constitutions, much as, at least as much as the letter of the law. And that kind of value, those kind of values were reflected from another uh, quotation from Mr. Justice John Murray in a case called A, where he talked about the, the values subtending cons the Constitution and that, princi that principles which are embodied in it have been developed over in Ireland over 70 years, which have a, a fundamental value and applicability it, from roots in national society, the European community, and international documents. All of these in our situation, with our pooled sovereignty situation, both as an independent nation state and as part of the European Union, are the documents which we look to when we're speaking of the spirit of the Constitution. For myself, I look with huge admiration at the, at the jurisprudence in Casavananda and the subsequent uh, judgments of the court. To my, for my shame, to my shame, I look at the judgments of the majority in the habeas corpus case because I, I, cite, I see there that one of the authorities which was relied on by the majority was the judgment of the Irish Supreme Court in 1935. And if you look at paragraphs 965, 969, 1045, 
1343 and 1347 of the ADM case, the majority judgment, you'll see an Irish precedent being cited because then, in 1935, our constitution was, being, was capable of being amended by parliamentary resolution. And that was the Achilles heel of our first 1922 constitution, remedied in 1937 by the ad adoption by the people in referendum of our constitution of 1937, which doesn't allow for any amendment other than by referendum, in other words, by the people. So we know that the Court of India uh, and the judges of India, especially J Justice Khanna, gave expression to the spirit behind the constitution, life and liberty. And I don't have to tell you about that because you know, know about it in, in your own constitutional law lectures. And we also know about the period of great judicial activism that followed involving the recognition of the right to privacy, pollution, free air, education, health, free legal aid. But what I want to do is ask a, a harder question now, is are there limits to constitutionalism? Should, are there ways, are there points at which a court should say stop? And are there limits to the way in which a court should engage in creative interpretation. Because what I'm going to touch on very briefly towards conclusion of this is a re remarkable piece, a series of judgments from the Court of Justice of the European Union. These, to my mind, illustrate what, ju what judicial uh, creativity ca can, can amount to. Uh, I, know you, I know you haven't had lectures on European Union law, but I'll just give you a, a nutshell about the, what the European Union is. It's an amalgam of 28 European states, you know that. They come together by treaties negotiated between the member states, you know that. These treaties set out the broad general principles, as all treaties do, you know that. But what's less known and appreciated is a vast amount is left to the Court of Justice of the European Union to, as it were, fill in the gaps. And that gap filling has played a fundamental role in the creation of the entity, of the polity that, that is known as the European Union. To an extent that I think you will all find quite surprising. Because in a series of judgments, which I'll just touch on now, again talking about the spirit, what the Court of Justice did is looked at what was the, what they thought was its raison d'etre. So if we go to the rationale for all this, the sad rationale, does anyone recognize that? That's the gate of Auschwitz concentration camp. And the words over it are, Ar Arbeit macht frei, where work will make you free. A supreme irony. And if you go to the, we go to the next one, that's, that's Auschwitz-Birkenau, where um, over a million Jewish people died. And if we go to the next one, there, that shows the rail tracks where the Jewish people and the gypsies and the gays were brought to that concentration camp. And if we go to the next one, that shows their boots, their shoes that they wore, still there in Auschwitz-Birkenau to this day. And if we go to the next one, See the cases, they're, ha they're the cases that were used by the people who are placed in that concentration camp because they were promised they were going to go to somewhere else to carry out work. Those tracks, those rail tracks we looked at a moment ago, led to the end of their lives. M millions died in the Second World War, as you know, including millions of, I millions of people in, in this part of the world. But at the end of it, the, part, the European powers, those who, which had not been conquered by Germany and those which had, came together and said, if you just look at those words, it's in Hebrew at the top, but then beneath that are the words, never again, in English. Never again was there going to be a war between states in Europe which would kill, as the Second World War did, some 50 to 60 million people all over the world. Never again would that be allowed to happen. So 
resorting to that proposition, the states of Europe negotiated in the late 1940s to ensure that it never again happened, that France and Germany and Britain became involved in war. And that a Holocaust of the type that occurred could occur again. So what they did is they came together first uh, in a series of negotiations. They first of all uh, agreed on the Convention of European right, Rights, which as I mentioned earlier, set out a series of rights uh, very similar to the Bill of Rights. It's a quite a short document. But the idea in 1948-49, even espoused by Winston Churchill, was that there would be a European state as a bulwark against the communist states which had gone that as far as East Germany, Hungary, Czechoslovakia. Uh, th that idea was greeted with enthusiasm by six member states, the original six members of the EU, who mysteriously, uh, in, a, in a curious reflection of history, came together reflecting an entity, a historical entity, which was the empire of Charlemagne, who, who had reigned about a thousand years before, 1100 years before, and they came together. The British, as we know, did not. The French resisted their coming together. Uh, the French resisted the British joining because they considered that they were insular, uh, likely to be, create difficulties within the European Union, and were likely to be uncommunicated uncommunist in their approach. Uh, who knows, maybe they were right. But the in effect of this was not only to create a, a, a convention to which, as it happened, the European Convention on Human Rights has 47 members, including Russia as far as Ireland. And there are judges from 47 member states but there also, also <coughs> is the European Union, uh, which was created by a series of treaties between the Treaty of Rome in 1957 and the Treaty of Lisbon in 2009. Why am I telling you all this? I'm telling you this because what actually happened was that the court, the Court of Justice, which was set up even before the European Union, played a pivotal role in creating the European Union itself. And if we look at what was said in the judgments of the, of the Court of Justice, first of all there were the treaties, but then in a remarkable judgment, the Court of, of the European Court had to deal with what was supposed to be an issue about the importation tax of urea formaldehyde from Holland to Germany. But what, what, what it actually did was talk about what the entity, the polity, was that was to be the European Union. And instead of just talking about whether or not there should be a duty, it redefined the European Union itself, even before the European Union existed in its present sense. So it talked about uh, the limitation of sovereign rights. It talked about the way in which the states have come together and independently of the legislation created a community law which imposes obligations on, on all members. And these are rights because of the treaties. And they're clearly defined. And what effectively happened there was a resort, I'm talking again about the spirit of the law, to a new creation, the first step in a new creation, the constitutionalization of Europe. And that was done by a court which was actually established to deal with issues of, issues of free, free trade, free market. When you think about it, when you think about a court actually constituting a policy, it is quite a big step. And if we look at the next two or three judgments, you see expressions which actually convey the values which were, for example, in Costa there, what was entailed by the creation of the community, 
the limitations on rights of the, of the member states and the duties which adhere to member states and the way in which European law was to operate in a manner supreme to all national law. And if we look at the next, next two judgments, where the Simenthal, where again the Court of Justice made a re resorting to something much more than the letter of the law, but the spirit of the law, resorted to further terminology to define what the policy was. Now, if we look at the, the last one to Van Coulson, national legislation, just go back to Na Van Coulson, national legislation must be interpreted in the light of EU law. In other words, when you look at an act, a national act, you look at it and interpret it in accordance with EU law. So, what are the pluses and minuses of that? I'm back to the, the moth. It seems to me that as a result of the way in which the e EU court evolved, they, they did it, they made those decisions because of exasperation and frustration with the, with the political membership. They considered that the member states w were paralyzed, that they would not come together, that they would not create a European Union, and consequently they resorted to the spirit of the treaties. They resorted to the spirit of an ever closer union as being their rationale for the achievement of that ever closer union. This was manifested in a series of radical judgments which I've just described, which are called the uh, heroic period of the Court of, of Justice. There were a series of further judgments in the 1970s, 1980s, 1990s, talking about what European citizenship was. What, why did this arise? Well, you can't be a citizen unless there's a polity, a, a, a state to which you're, of which you're a citizen. And as a result of that, ultimately, we, we ended up, I ended up bearing a European passport with the same color as the other member states, although it's still an Irish passport as well. So what that was was a remarkable uh, essay in judicial creativity and a broad interpretation, very broad interpretation, but a, re a resort to the spirit of the law, a resort to the spirit which lay behind the treaties. But there are pluses and minuses to that, as we now see. The pluses were it achieved, although at, at, at some political cost, a Lego, Lego like, you know, you know Lego, a, a bringing together of the member states. It brought, broke down customs barriers. It created a spirit of European Union unity. It made things happen. But the other side of the equation is when Europe came in the late, uh, later on, that is in the early 2000s, to devise a constitution called the Charter of Fundam Fundamental Rights and Freedoms. And that was put to the public in France and in Holland and in Ireland, ultimately, it was rejected. And it was rejected, I think, because of the fact that there was what's called a democratic deficit. And that democratic deficit was a perception that the institutions of Europe, the Commission, which, which is the central hub, and the court, had gone too far too fast. And the issue, the lesson from all of this, is it raises the question as to whether courts can go too far, too fast, and what the consequences are. You can, for example, have a consequence where as a result of a court going too far, too fast, you lose the public opinion. You can have a consequence where as a result of engaging in judicial initiative, you achieve one end, but perhaps at the cost of others. But the plus of it, and I'm speaking about the plus, is that there are come times when you speak about constitutional identity, to, that is to protect the very identity of the constitution, such as in the emergency, such as in the German constitution. You must do it in order to protect the integrity of a constitution. And furthermore, there are come times when, when you resort to the spirit of the constitution, as was done in India, as was done in the EU, you achieve 
values and results which are put at risk by, by people resorting to the, quote, letter of the law. And as we saw earlier from Justice Henshey, the, the letter can kill and the spirit can give life. Thanks very much. We, we, we ended with saying that the letter killer but the spirit gives life. Now, is this, is, this, uh, is this a conclusion that would always be true in all circumstances is what I am trying, trying to present. And what I am also trying to do perhaps is to say that when we say the letter killeth in certain contexts. In a certain other contexts when we find that it is a letter that gives us that gives us the life, what are we referring to? And I and I will of course largely be speaking in the context of the Indian Constitution. Given given that the Indian Constitution, like the Irish Constitution, is a product of a particular national struggle and the drafting of the constitution, at least in the, con in the, in the context of the Indian constitution, was, was so, so carefully documented, perhaps in the belief that this is a very important exercise in the manner in which this country would be governed. Now, if we want to disregard this letter of the constitution in favor of something that is as vague an idea as the spirit and the identity of the constitution, are we doing disservice to the letter of the constitution? Go stand. No, not, not my letter. So when, when we are saying that let us look at the fundamental rights that we have written out into the constitution and the context of let us say the affirmative action program that we have written out so painstakingly. Would one want, the, want these provisions to be interpreted in the context of the letter? That uh, perhaps if one resorted to something like the spirit of the constitution or the identity of the constitution. And let me engage for a minute with are these two necessarily the same ideas or can they be different ideas? So when we say spirit of the constitution, in many, at many times what we are also referring to is the ideals of constitutionalism as well, which, which are not particular to any, any country, but which are particular to constitutional governance across the world. So when we say, when we say what we are referring to as a spirit of the constitution, we are not necessarily referring to the spirit of the Indian or the Irish or the German constitution, but at many times we are referring to the idea of constitutionalism. And the idea of constitutionalism is to allow an interpretation that gives value and that gives precedent to a certain set of values which have been written into the constitution, which have been written into the constitution. So, and, and this is also very familiar to those of us who have done Indian constitution and the basic structure theory, that one understanding of the basic structure theory was to keep it as something that is over and above the constitution, something hanging in the air, Whereas the idea that we perhaps are now more closely working with is that no, the identity of the constitution, the spirit of the constitution is not some overarching idea, but it needs to be rooted in the specific provisions of the constitution. And we have come back full circle to a certain extent where we say basic structure also needs to be located in the specific provisions of the constitution. And so in many ways we, we, are, we are moving away that although the idea of basic structure is the idea of spirit and identity, we are also coming back to giving some importance to the text of the constitution. So in, the, in, this, in this manner are we, are, have we, or are we moving away from the idea of the spirit of the constitution 
to the text of the constitution to provide greater illumination even in questions of basic structure. Because when we, when we have begun to look at the identity of a constitution, we are looking at the identity of the constitution in terms of certain, cert certain sets of provisions in the constitution. And when we refer to provisions uh, referring to democracy or judicial review or social justice in the constitution, we are saying that it is these provisions which are giving identity to our constitution. So again here, are we not really coming back to the text of the constitution to provide light and illumination rather than to any other relatively vague idea of spirit or uh, certain constitutional values which are not written into the text of the constitution. And so this is, this is the real question that is there for certain constitutions should we and that for, for forward looking modern constitutions like the Indian constitution should we really be referring to ideas other than those which have been explicitly written out given also that we have one of the longest constitutions that has been written out shouldn't we actually be trying to give effect to these to this text and it is a matter of interpretation that we find that certain provisions have not been given the effect that they were so if you go back to gopalan and say that gopalan refused to read 1419 together or refused to read 19, 21, 22 together, or refused to read any right with the other right. It was, a, it was a matter of constitutional interpretation that was wrong. There was nothing in the constitution that said that you couldn't read equality with liberty or liberty with anything else. It was, it was a certain judicial, judicial approach which later got overruled when you said that no, the rights need to be read together. So in both cases, it was not really a question of the text of the constitution as much as what, you're, what meaning you are ascribing to the text of the constitution. So should we really say that the difference there is between textualism and purposive interpretation or that the text was not really read properly at all? So in the Indian context, for example, if, if, you, if you believe that the text of the constitution embodies aspects of social justice then are you are you allowed to move away from these concepts to say that no that whatever be in the text of the constitution social justice is not really the most important aspect or we will find ways of interpreting social justice provisions in accordance with certain other values or in, in accordance with something else that we are referring to as the spirit of the constitution and the reading that we have done on what we understand as constitutional morality really does not allow us to privilege certain ends that we think are important over the manner in which those ends must be reached. So if we, if it is, if we are saying that what we mean by constitutional morality is a commitment to form and what we are saying is that the form is, is, is important as long as the form is legitimate the only reason that one can resort to overturning the form is that when you find the form not legitimate when you say that no this method of coming to a coming to a conclusion is wrong that is the only way in which you can say that the, the manner in which you reach that conclusion can be set aside otherwise you are bound by the by the, by the method by which that 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 end needs to be reached and you can't say that the end will justify the means and so i can do whatever as long as i reach this end even if it is a question of social justice because by relying on, by asking or by putting the burden on the judiciary in that extent to interpret the constitution in accordance with the spirit of the constitution, you are placing a great burden and you are assuming that it will always be used to a particular end. And I think the whole question of public interest litigation has demonstrated that while public interest litigation was useful at a particular point of time, to raise certain important questions of marginalization, the same instrument has been used for very different ends. So does this raise questions that public interest litigation in the first place was the wrong form even though it was justified for certain ends? Because now what we are finding problematic with is the form itself, that PIL itself, the form itself has been misused. If one is then willing to talk about purposive interpretation as the method of interpretation, then the whole idea of neutrality in judicial process is also affected. Now is 
Where, why does the idea of neutrality continue to have great relevance to us? Because when you say, when you use the idea of neutrality, it is often misunderstood, or it is often possibly the case that it results in a status quo interpretation. While that is true, when we say that neutrality can be jettisoned for certain ends, then what, what allows those ends to be predetermined? And who says that it is only these ends for which neutrality may be set aside and neutrality may not be set aside for certain other ends? So this, this, this perhaps is also one of the questions that one needs to think about when one is saying that the text of the constitution, of any constitution, can then give way to ideas of spirit or ideas of purpose or ideas of identity. One of the, one of the important uh, downsides of comparative constitutional law, as Justice McMillan pointed out, is the role of chance in comparative constitutional law and in terms of purpose or spirit. It is only by chance that you had a German professor addressing, addressing a, a gathering and it is only by chance that that gathering used a particular idea and it is only by chance that the Supreme Court actually picks up the idea and makes it an important contribution to the, to the jurisprudence of India. And how legitimate is this idea of a chance that when we have deliberated not to have a predetermined basic structure, how legitimate it is for this chance to then get into this whole idea of determining the basic structure of the Indian constitution, notwithstanding what, whether it was, it was uh, good or bad. Given, given that we are, we are now proposing the idea of a purposive interpretation, which then allows for the use of comparative material, which then allows the use of values, which then allows the use of spirit and identity to come into interpretation, are we then going to say that, oh, but this is something that is only a, the prerogative of the higher judiciary, or is this something that we are willing to then extend to the lower judiciary as well? And one important distinction that we can make between the Irish and the Indian constitution is this idea of a horizontal application of rights. Now, one of the ideas that the Irish constitution does not prohibit is the idea of a horizontality of rights and a horizontality of interpretation in the sense that even the judges of the lower judiciary, the trial court, can use constitutional values in the interpretation of statute. Now, when we talk about dynamic interpretation and dynamic interpretation in terms of giving, allowing the use of, of multiple material, then how much of dynamic interpretation is then possible within not just the High Court and the Supreme Court, but is also possible at the other stages of the judicial process. And given that in the latest decision of the Supreme Court, and this is something I hope students are listening to a little carefully, and I want you to respond to this, that if the distinction between amendments, constitutional amendments and ordinary law has been done away with by the Supreme Court, now, is, is this an idea that then allows us to play with the idea of horizontality, to then say that, yes, the constitutionality of an ordinary law or the interpretation of an ordinary law, and when I'm saying ordinary, I'm only referring to the idea that this is not constitutional law. The interpretation of other statutes can also be done and should, in fact, be done by reference to constitutional values. And in statutory interpretation, the constitution must then play an important role. And I, I, I hope there will be enough responses to this for us to go on. So please feel free to ask questions. more a clarificatory question. I was wanting to understand when you said that we should not be depending upon chance. Uh, could you please clarify what yeah. you meant? By yeah. that? I, I think I, I, one of the, the, the idea of a chance in uh, use of comparative material was commented upon earlier when he mentioned that when Conrad came and lectured in India and he talked about basic structure of the German constitution, that was an idea that was picked up and used in the, uh, in the formulation of the arguments about why we should not uh, allow only part, part 3 or why part 3 would also be, why part 3 is basic structure and which led to the creation of basic structure theory. 
Now, the the criticism of that is that this is this is so random that you're then going to allow an idea that only comes in by way of argumentation in courts to then to then cast an influence on the way in which the constitution needs to be understood. So the opponents to basic structure theory are also talking about how an argument of basic structure and the and its basis, particularly in comparative law, uh, is 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 so random that it is problematic in using of comparative materials in constitutional interpretation. That's that's where I was. For, ex for example, if, um, if 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 we had if, if if you looked at the discussion we had yesterday, which was I think one of the most stimulating discussions I've ever been at in in any forum anywhere about textualism, uh, Scalia, the United States Constitution. It provoked, I think, a, a reaction whereby we all began to think about what we do when we're engaging in constitutional interpretation. But not only that, it also alerted us to what can be involved in constitutional interpretation. But not only that, it also alerted us to the need for comparative constitutionalism, because these things are too important to be left to chance encounters. And that's, in my view, what the value of scholarship in this area is for the interaction between judiciary and the academy in order to determine what, what the true context of a, of a judgment is. If you, I, just before I came out here in July, there was a case I dealt with in our Supreme Court where a judge had, that had addressed a, a United States president, but he hadn't contextualized it. He hadn't dealt with the minority judgment. He hadn't dealt with the statute that, that was being dealt with. He hadn't dealt with in f fully with the right which was being invoked in the US Constitution, that's the right to property. And in those circumstances, you can go wrong. So I take that as an example. A little more, if we engage in comparative constitutionalism, we forestall and reduce the risk of, the, of faulty decision making, which is predicated upon an imperfect understanding of the context in which cases are, are, arise. It, it particularly ar arises because, uh, as we said yesterday and the day before, judges are prone to lighting on passages in judgments, quotations, which seem to them to encapsulate a particular bit of wisdom that they want to convey. But the, w the risk is that it may be decontextualized. And the risk is that unless we un fully understand the context in which the citation arises, that there will be flawed reasoning. I wouldn't disagree. I mean, I would disagree with this kind of caution that you are pointing out in how we should be looking at comparative constitutional uh, precedents. One, I I would have a trifle different narrative for uh, Conrad's intervention and how it got used by the court. But importantly also, I would want to put forth a side as to how, forget about how we look at foreign precedents. We need to very closely look at how we look at even Indian precedents. Do we really follow the stare decisis theory in its kind of pristine classical mode? or we are totally eclectic about it. Because if you take that, uh, you know, the, the way in which uh, you need to be looking at, then you need to look at it contextually. You find people, the same judgment is quoted by the, the, the dissenting and the majority mm -hmm. judge. In the same judgment, because each of them has extracted different paragraphs out of it, and neither has read it contextually. So when we are setting up that kind of critique, and we would see there is an entire argument from a certain body of thought that the reason why we should not be endorsing the classical view of precedence is because if you endorse the classical view of precedence, the, the same excluded disadvantaged groups who were not there when those precedents were set, they are never ever going to be able to get an entry point. So that's where my anxiety would come in a country like ours, which has been at forcing of privilege and elitism, if you want to take the classical view of precedence. But there are risks. 
No, evidently, sir, there are risks. It's, it's a, it's a, if, a, if I had to take a, the carryover from the discussion that you started in the faculty meeting, I would very much say that it's the, the fact that it is risky and you need to be pointing risk and wanting juristic strategies which offset that risk. That I would go for. But we really need to be very cautious if by reason of the risks we go and set up an argument which is clearly status quoist, clearly for the privilege, clearly for the elitist, because up to that extent a popular constitution. It was a constitution which got made by a set of people who were holding positions of power at that point of time. And I think that's something to be looked at as we develop our I thought there was something that you wanted to say about the context of the Indian constitution in terms of social justice, no? I'm not responding to Professor Dhanda though. I had an independent thought so we can let this conversation continue and maybe I can come in later. Sure. So, do we have other? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. yeah. Could, could you use, could you use the mic, please? Uh, any mic that's near, near nearest you, without doing your back end. Yeah. It is independent of what Ma'am has been saying. So the question goes back to the yesterday's lecture about uh, this license, which permits any court to do the comparative study. So, uh, when can we say that rel putting too much reliance upon originalism to see it as a restriction to do the comparative study may not hold good because if a constitutional machinery itself provides for an amendment of the constitution then too much reliance upon or too much reliance upon originalism may not be good. Are there any other interventions? Does anybody want no. to say anything? I would like to add uh, that the uh, Constitution is adopted in 19. It does not contain any provision or any declaration that it is a supremacy that only to be followed as in words. So, you know, um, it's been interpreted from time to time and we take it as deemed by the makers of the Constitution that this is what you have and you have to follow. But now with the changing society and changing trends, there's been a lot of problems and the makers of the Constitution may not have thought at that time with the changing society. So, it all depends on the supreme supremacy of the Supreme Court and also the High Court interpreting the Constitution in a better way with the changing society and the problems which are coming up. So, you have the cases, you have the reasoning, you have the judgments. So it's the constitution is not changed. Nothing has been changed the constitution. If it is something which is ultra wise then it is definitely being put up. But then when you have the judgments which are there for you to interpret the constitution a better way, then you have to follow that. Rather than you amending the constitution or you know you going ahead with uh, a thought that you know it has to be compared with the constitution of other countries. I think the constitution is fully fledged and it's been, uh, it's, it covers everything. It's only the interpretation with the society. That's it. Thank you. But, but do you, if you embark on a, a, a broad, creative, purpose of interpretation of a constitution, which I favor, I, I, I frankly say I do favor it, especially in circumstances we were discussing earlier, the risk is you don't bring people with you. And in, a, in an invisible, strange way, courts have constituencies just as politicians do. And what you have to do, it seems to me, is be carefully calibrate how far you go, lest what you do is you lose people. And if you look at the United States, there's quite, people make quite a strong case that the rise of populism in the United States has something to do with the fact that the Supreme Court went ahead of the public in the 1960s, 1970s, 1980s. And as a result, the court was perceived not as uh, um, espousing the values of the, we, the people, but espousing the values of we, some of the people. And I think that's the risk. I'm with you, but I think the risk is we, we must be so careful to ensure that courts engage in the process of 
making judgments which vindicate the rights of all people. Um, and I'm talking about those who are marginalized, I'm talking about those who are dispossessed. But we must be so careful to ensure that when we do it, we reason it and inter interpret the constitutions in a way where we don't lose the people. And I think that's an important point. Working? Yeah. Uh, so I think also when we're looking at the constitution, um, maybe you should understand what the word the constitution even means. Because if we look at it narrowly in terms of like how the previous question was addressing it, it would only refer to the text, whereas the interpretation, whereas the interpretation of the constitutional text itself is arguably a part of what we today identify as the constitution, because it is independent of that interpretation, the constitution is um, just there. Um, so, so I think that if we expand our meaning to include interpretation and um, contextual factors as well, then we come closer to um, closer to something that you were mentioning uh, in your concluding note, which is what I want to ask: whether um, we identify the spirit of the constitution as extra textual or intra textual. I mean, I know you're doing the bad cop, good cop thing. So yesterday you would have agreed with me on it being uh, extra textual, and today you won't. But so I wanted to, I was asking that, is it at least debatable whether it's extra textual or intra textual? If you look at the way in which the basic structure theory has evolved, I think today, today the Supreme Court is more likely to say that it is rooted in the text of the constitution than when it started off. The entire idea of the two part test that we're talking about or if you look at look at also the idea of the uh, of the width test that we are using, these are all these are all tests which have text, tests which have been invoked in the context of specific provisions in the constitution. No longer that this is an independent test, and now that we are saying that this is something that is going to be used for ordinary laws as well, then you are you are actually then making that difference between spirit of the constitution and the text of the constitution as not be as as being you know you don't no longer have to rely on the spirit of the constitution to make a certain interpretation but the text and the interpretation of the text is sufficient for you to uh, understand even something like basic structure so if we are if we are there then is there any argument left for ideas of spirit uh, and if you're identifying identity also in terms of certain provisions in the constitution then aren't you much relying much more on uh, perhaps an expanded textual all right but it's still textual I'm, I'm referring the example I'm giving you is in terms of how the basic structure theory stands today and how it started off and it originated one could perhaps say that it was extra textual but today I think it's largely more textual than it was when it started off so what does that tell us but I, I, I just tell you a story which comes from, from my own background in Ireland and you may say what, what on earth has this to do with the uh, Indian constitution interpretation? Quite a lot I think. Uh, we were discussing earlier today the issue of abortion in Ireland which is a very divisive issue. But at one stage uh, a leading constitutional scholar who was a very strong Roman Catholic espoused the view that by resorting to the, that, that this people, even if by referendum they were to change the constitution, even if they were to allow for abortion, they would be break, breaking a law antecedent to the constitution. Now what law was that? That was the Roman Catholic idea of natural law. And the, the, one of the, the pluses of, of resorting to the spirit of the constitution is obviously that you can achieve social justice. But the, the one where I think you, ha you have to take care is what ethos or antecedent values are you going to resort to when you're actually going to interpret the Constitution in a very broad way. And if you say there's something antecedent to the Constitution, uh, faith, values, but then you have to ask yourself, does that, does that govern everyone? Uh, are, we, are we the court or the judges seeking to impose an ethos or values on others which, which are not ours by resorting to the, the, the spirit of the Constitution as we conceive it. Uh, 
there is a comment and a question. So, comment to what ma'am had raised, whether the constitution remains the same or not. So, just to invoke a little Fletcher, and we can say that the constitution, the words of the constitution can only be a bare skeleton into which our interpretation falls in the flesh and blood. So just to add to a little, uh, j just to comment on what man had said. So the words of the constitution, if we look at it as the skeleton, then our interpretation becomes the flesh and blood. So uh, example of what the judiciary has done. So 13 to remains quite the same, but when we, of course there's been a small amendment, but when you look at Golak Nathan, he say, it says a constitutional amendment cannot be called law. When we look at Keshwan and Abarthi and it says a constitutional amendment can be called law. It's true that the text moral and majorly remains the same. But then we see that the constitution has undergone a change. There is one thing in uh, there is uh, one question. So sir spoke about constitutional antecedents and how we can refer to it for knowing the spirit of the constitution. So we, when we look at the constitutional antecedents or when we look at the debates that go into framing of a constitution, we see that the discourse never remains the same. There are multiple discourses through which we have the formation of a constitution. And for the same provision, we might have three or four different views on why the provision came into place. So how do we arrive at which position the courts ought to follow? stated that uh, perhaps when Keshavananda Bharti was was um, was was passed the the constitutional the basic structure is extra constitutional whereas now it would be intra constitutional isn't the premise there that the constitution is alive and isn't the question before us whether the constitution can be deemed as a living organism because if so if we've accepted that it is now a part of the constitution, then are we not operating under the premise that the constitution has been alive all along? But isn't the debate rather whether the constitution is alive or whether it isn't, whether the text is permanent? So I just think that's slightly circular, if that makes sense. Can you, can you clarify a little more on the idea of the constitution being alive at no point of time are we talking about the death of the constitution? We're only talking about... So can you elaborate on organism, that? Organism. Apologies. Yeah? A living organism. No. Okay. The, the idea of a living organism is always there. I mean, I don't think this really engages with that. But the question is whether, since it is a living organism, should you be looking for beyond that to find its meaning or you should look at it, at it for its meaning itself? I mean, it's living, right? So you know what the meaning is. Why should you be looking for something else unless this is dead? Sort of respond to this uh, intertextuality. And, yeah, I, and the, the the proposition you were putting forth in the fact that we have started to use the basic structure doctrine in how we are interpreting our statutes, and that in in the fact that we are starting to draw upon it to interpreting statutes is where from you uh, you are pressing for this factor of that possibly we are closer to intertextuality than extratextuality. I had kind of uh, a slight agreement, and a, I mean a part agreement and a part disagreement with the proposition you are putting forth. So the way I see it is that the basic structure doctrine was born in the whole context of you are trying to save the constitution from the process of amendment. And to be saying that there are certain something there which is unamendable. Now what is that something? If you take the entire Kelsinian notion, then evidently the constitution, when it is saying there are some things on which it has, which is its grund norm, 
that Grund norm cannot be inside the constitution, it has to be outside the constitution. That's how I would see when you're looking at the whole basic structure doctrine in the context of amending the constitution. When you are looking at statutes and the constitution, then the constitution becomes the Grund norm and I would be in agreement with you that yeah, that would be a more intertextual thing. So I would somewhere say that we need to see these as two different sort of approaches rather than to say that the extra textual one has been subsumed in the intertextual one. I would say contextually it would be intertextual when you are looking at the relationship between the statute and the constitution, but it will be extra textual every time you have to have an amendment which is in some way going to change. And those values, that entire constitutionalism dimension will not come from within the text. We can, we have to keep the whole notion of spirit alive. And I am taking the cautions of that, you know, whenever you go a little expansive, larger route, you open up things. But I feel the fact that you're opening up and that the opening up may be, may be risky, may have its own perils, is no reason not to open up. Could I give you an example of why it, I, 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 on the one hand, am in favor of the, uh, the resorting to the spirit of a constitution, but uh, the, also the risk. Say, i just give you a hypothesis. Say I was a judge in some country A, and say that the courts of that country A had held that the constitution was not capable of being amended in some particulars and say that I was a judge in that country A, and I said that by resorting to the spirit of the Constitution, the democratic will of the, of the people should trump the idea of basic structure. Then where would we be? But I'm talking about country A. Very surprisingly quiet, everybody. Please remember, we still have a prize for good questions. Uh, so, ma'am, my uh, question evo uh, stands on the foundational read on a comparative reading of the uh, directive principles of social policy in the Irish Constitution and the directive principles of state policy. So, at the first level, we see at a very semantic level the difference between social policy and state policy. So, and on building on that, a, a, a further reading into the DPSPs would tell us that while the Irish constitution speaks of them in terms of principles as to what all can be done or has to be done by the state and at, at the Indian constitution talks about uh, the programs. So we see Gangan philosophy into action, uh, we talk about legal aid in panchayats and so on and so forth. So at that level we see a distinction between mere principles in the Irish constitution and specific programs in the Indian constitution apart from certain principles as well. And therefore, the another conclusion that we draw from this is that the Indian constitution is more detailed when it talks about the DPSPs. So, uh, and <coughs> the, the, the sort of reliance that courts, especially today, have come to place on the DPSP. So, the nature of DPSPs was uh, that they were uh, sought to be kept explicitly out of the court's domain and merely uh, for guidance to the other organs of the government. But, sir, in India, there has been an increasing reliance by the courts, especially culminating into recent judgments which have imposed uh, uh, requirements adhering to patriotism and uh, 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 the mandatory uh, uh, playing of national anthem in cinema halls. So therefore we see that courts are increasingly, and even when we see petitions that are uh, placed before courts, they do talk about DPSPs. So the experience in India has been to lay some form of reliance on DPSPs while uh, rights-based litigation is taking place. My question is because the uh, DPSPs in the Irish constitution are less detailed and therefore uh, uh, more ambiguous and vague, what is the experience uh, in the Ireland in contrast to what has been in India? If you could just, ex what has been the experience of Ireland in, ju just explain to me a little more. Uh, so sir, in India, the courts are dealing with director principles of state policy whereas their intrinsic nature was to be kept out of the court's purview. And this is happening in a constitutional framework which details specific DPSPs, whereas the Irish constitution talks more about the principles. So now I link it to the uh, two modes of interpretation, textualism and 
purpose of interpretation. So courts in India uh, sometimes place reliance on, for example, curtailing right, uh, fundamental rights. So, uh, and uh, the, so there is some amount of jurisprudence which says that if, for example, a law seeks to promote a DPSPs, some fundamental rights can be uh, uh, can be uh, in, uh, in, can be curtailed to that particular extent. So we see that the DPSPs, which are more detailed, are not completely out of the court's domain, and uh, therefore the, the 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 court sometimes draw the purpose out of the DPSPs. So what has happened in the uh, Irish context, if at all, DPSPs have come to the court's domain over there. I th I think that I if you look at our uh, just so that everyone knows, uh, our, our um, article very specifically said that the directives are um, non-cognizable by the courts, non-justiciable, -just and that has been fairly religiously followed, but the courts have from time to time uh, had made reference to them, because non-cognizable doesn't necessarily mean that you can't make reference to them. Uh, it doesn't mean that they're non just it that doesn't mean that they're absolutely beyond the pale so far as reference is concerned but if you look at our directives they reflect a vision or a spirit of society which was very fixed in the 1930s and very rural based and very traditional um, in some ways i i, I, uh, I, I know that the, the indian situation is different but if we if our courts had given expression to those values, which were Mr. De Valera's vision of Ireland, which was rural, village-based, static, um, rather conservative. We would, it would have taken our, our society quite a long time to evolve from that, if we had given effect to them. Uh, just to add to the story in the European Union, we not only have, uh, do, do we have the treaties, not only do we have the Court of Justice, but as a result of a recent treaty, that's the Treaty of Lisbon, there's a new, uh, yet another layer of constitutionalism which we have to deal with. Ah, uh, yeah, uh, I know Europe, I know, I know. Um, it's the Charter of Fundamental Rights and Freedoms, and that does give rise to social values, uh, and they, they, the curious thing is we do interpret European law purposefully when we're dealing with issues which are, and broadly, which are when we're dealing with issues of European law. So it's a, for the future, one of the challenges facing us will be to, to engage in an interpretation of a charter or a document which does give rise to social policies. And for myself, my concern is that we come from a common law background, and I'm not always sure that we're very good at Lit at litigation in such a way that we look at every eventuality when a social issue comes before us. I know the South African courts have demonstrated that it can be done, but you need to be very careful doing it. So, uh, I think this might be a good place for my comment to come in. When we speak of purposive interpretation, there are two kinds of purpose we can interpret in light of. There's one, which is the generic constitutionalism. So I'm interpreting the text of the Constitution in light of what ought to be its underlying purpose. So if we didn't have a conversation on the rights of the LGBTQ in the famous debates, let's assume we did, and they said that no, this is bad in Indian culture and therefore they will expressly not have rights, then the generic constitutionalism would have had to play a role. And I, there's another kind of purpose of interpretation, which is the purpose of the text as of 1950. Now the Scalia block debate that we rejected yesterday aligns with conservatism in the US because it's a conservative constitution. So it's easy to say, let's not look to the purpose of the American constitution because it is a regressive bad document. But ours was a post-colonial constitution committed to eradication of a lot of social evils. So caste and touchability would play a big role in that conversation. And sometimes there is value to textualist interpretation in light of the purpose as of 1940 for the constitution of India just because of our framework being so radically different from the American framework. So my comment is just that I wouldn't hastily jettison textualism in light of the purpose of, as a textualism ally Scalia Burke, and that is a very specific kind of textualism. It's textualism with the 
intent as manifested on the debate. So it's an objective intent textualism. I wouldn't hastily jettison that kind of textualism in a post-colonial constitution committed to this kind of transformative agenda, which was not the case in America. So speaking to the dead hand of the past is just one of our concerns. That's all I wanted to say. Yeah. Um, I had a similar point to Malvika's except that I slightly differ on it as well that if like we have been mentioning again and again that you know we had a very clearly documented constant assembly debates but if you were to study them a lot of provisions that made it to the final draft were made in haste and were made as a piece of compromise. So our constitution is not a coherent document so it does not speak to a coherent set of principles or purposes. Um, it is a progressive document to a great extent, but one look at our directive principles would say that it is hyper-conservative. It speaks to values that uh, progressives would never relate to, socialists would never relate to. Um, at, to some extent, it is trying to limit state power and you know, put a limit on the extent of what the state can do. But it is also an enabling constitution. It empowers the state to enter into our lives in ways that no constitution has done before. So maybe a purposive interpretation has to account for the fact that we are not talking of coherent principles, uh, but compromised principles in a sense that where we are looking to live despite the fact that we contradict each other in, in significant ways. To explain it a little more, I mean, I don't think you've completed your idea. So, so when you're saying that there is no coherence, then how how does a purposive interpretation give that coherence, or or are you saying that the incoherence of the constitution is a good reason for saying that let's keep it textual because it's deliberately incoherent, and so because then purpose would try to give it a coherence that it doesn't have. I think I'm right now just saying that we need to account. As, as the sole proposition, as a whole. I mean, each provision could speak to a purpose, uh, but as a whole, it is a difficult argument to make that that we are uh, we could use of interpretation in the same sense. Is it okay? Now, I do hope um, okay. uh, I do hope I can articulate my discomfort in clear terms, but sir, this is a question to you. It's also something that I've been grappling in my own head with, that we can speak about questions of the separation of powers or as Ma'am spoke about constitutional morality as limiting what a judge engages in. But picking up what Bhanda Ma'am said, and if I understood that right, the risk of overstepping would itself not be an argument to not let a judge engage in something that could, at the end of the day, for at least one person, be something progressive. So for me, if a judge oversteps but at the end of that judgment, it has become a social good for even one person. I would be okay with that overstepping and I would not tell myself that because there is a possible risk of this being used in other situations, this should be reason for a judge to not have that discussion. So in that sense, I would say that yes, purpose of interpretation could advance to some good. But the question then becomes, if we are people who support it, is it then possible for us at any point of time to devise a limitation to it? Because my concern would be, I'm speaking as a, a judge, is that if you allow overstepping for a good purpose, a socially progressive purpose, are you also allowing it for a purpose with which you disagree? And once you allow, I mean, there's always a subjective dimension to judging. I, I, we've already discussed that. 
But if you allow an extreme subjective element to come in, and if it happens that you have the misfortune to disagree with the, the particular judge or the philosophy of the judge, but then I, I think you've pinpointed a very important point. It, it works great when you're, if you happen to be socially progressive, as I hope I am, and many are, but it doesn't work so well if you happen to have somebody who uses precisely the same procedural methodology in order to achieve something which you don't agree with. Uh, just to uh, comment on my learned uh, student here, uh, like he said, uh, we are not, the uh, Constitution is definitely a supremacy of law. But then we're not just going to the blind text of the Constitution, we have other laws also, like you know, you have to collaborate the other laws with the Constitution. The other laws have a lot of amendments now, uh, suppose, uh, say in case of uh, the rights of an accused under Article 20, then you have the CRPC to, you know, collaborate to it. You're just not following the Article 20 only. It is not only the compact document that you have to follow. You have to, you know, correlate with the other laws, other provisions, other amendments which are coming up with the changing society. Also, the judge, uh, like uh, the last speaker said, you know, the judge has to go beyond thinking and what is there in the books, what is there in the legislation. Yes, we do. Uh, but not exactly like, you know, we are not uh, sitting there to say, we have the reference provision, we have the review provision, the revision provision. If you are not for, if you are not really satisfied with the interpretation of the Constitution, go ahead, ask the Supreme Court, ask the Honorable High Court and Supreme Court for your, uh, refer, uh, refer to the whatever interpretation which you cannot make it and you think it's not in the, just in the compact legislation and you have to go beyond thinking the compact legislation of uh, the constitution. So you have all provisions, everything is there in the Bible, you know, the constitution, the all laws, everything is there. So when you interpret, you have to just see the provision and go ahead and ask the Honorable Supreme Court and the Apex Courts, that's it. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, so my question is connecting what Professor Dhanda said uh, to what Sir said a little while ago. So um, because uh, in, in your anecdote where um, the professor talks about the natural law as uh, the constitutional antecedent or um, as a grant norm external to the constitution, pre-constitution and, and hence we can rely on that as in terms of an identity or spirit, um, with respect to the Indian constitution, um, assuming that we go with Professor Dhanda's idea of um, it being extra textual, what do we identify as the identity? Because the Indian constitution doesn't give us, say, um, any sort of direction towards, let's say, natural law, um, Catholic beliefs, or it doesn't give us a religious doctrine to follow, it doesn't give us any ideological doctrine to follow, which is perhaps convenient that way for the Irish constitution. But then, um, w what option do we have? Uh, so that's a question and I'm also wondering whether that also further suggests the fact that um, given the plurality that uh, the Indian sort of society does contain and uh, going back to what uh, Amen mentioned about the incoherence that is evident in our constitution because it's trying to bring together like several uh, disparate voices into framing a sort of charter is it, can we perhaps therefore say that um, the form or constitutionalism is uh, the basis or the grant norm f or the spirit therefore of our constitution? Because in the absence of uh, a pluralistic society such as ours being able to decide on a single value or a normative principle. Just in relation to our constitution in 1995, our, my predecessors, made very clear that the only law to be found in Ireland was in the Constitution itself and that there was to be no resort to natural law which represented the views of, of any one faith. The, the court pronounced that the Constitution catered for many faiths and those who, are, who have none. So consequently, it was a response to the contention that the, the one should resort to natural law. We d we d natural law has no part Catholic natural law has no part to play in the interpretation of our constitution anymore. <laughs>
despite what the Constitution, some of the provisions would appear to convey. We, that's about evolving society, and it's a resort, it's also a reflection of the way in which Irish society has changed so radically. Um, we discussed earlier, you know, the, the, the way in which, for example, we had the referendum about rights of marriage for gay people, which would be rather a surprise to the, uh, the framers of the 1937 Constitution. Yeah. Um. In, in the sense of somebody else has I just wanted to uh, uh, respond to this factor of that where do you draw that extra textuality from there's a body of writing which is kind of pressed on the fact of that we need to be looking at the values of the freedom movement and the kind of things which at that point of time at different junctures on the principles and values on which we fought for freedom that should be taken on, on board in how and where you draw from. I would also like partly connect with the point that Ayman was making because I heard him differently. I heard it as that if you have these kind of very contradictory pressures which caused for the text to be settled in certain kinds of ways, and I think most of all, uh, you have it in the directive principles because you have very, very contentious kind of questions being put together and saying, TK, you can also, you know, we've checked this box also and checked that box also. And if you were to take a very textualized kind of line and you were to look at the kind of privileging we have been doing of the directive principles in relation to fundamental rights and you did not look at that larger you know then it would you would the textual interpretation could get you into big time trouble so it's from there that one uh, needs to sorry i want to make one thing absolutely clear no matter how many contributions you make you're not getting our prize of the constitution (laughs) sir i will just get it (laughs) you wouldn't be able to deny me So I just wanted to, because there there are authors, you know, like, who have written from there and said, so you might want to look at some of those, uh, and I just wanted to alert that this is So just to uh, join the discussion relating to interpretation of directory principle of state policy and the fundamental rights or certain other kind of rights. So during the integration of India, certain princes, quote unquote, their excellencies were compensated by uh, a privy purse was created, which was charged on the consolidated fund of India. So the union government in 1970s abolished it. So one of the argument of the union for its abolishment was that it serves no purpose now and in order to do the social justice we have to abolish it. So the thread of the argument which I am taking is that there has to be certain kind of director principle, certain policies which has to make a way, uh, there, there, has, there are certain policies which are so fundamental that when a fundamental right or any kind of right comes on its way, it has to make way for the policies of the state. Well, um, on behalf of myself and the bad policeman, I want to thank you all for your contributions. Yet again, I think we've demonstrated the value of this course, because what it does is in a number of purposes. It demonstrates, for myself and for others, it alerts us to the the huge positives in comparative constitutional study. It alerts us to the risks and hazards and it provokes thought and it provokes insights into our own respective constitutions.
it raises the question as to the extent to which there are universal values to which judges should have resort. It raises questions as to the nature of those universal values and whether, as Judge Bork said, there is effectively a, cons a, a world conspiracy of judges conspiring against the public interest. I don't agree with that view. But it is important we're alive to these issues because of the fact that ultimately we are not in a universe of ourselves. We know, like John Dunn said, no judge, no man is an island, no judge is an island entire of itself. We live in a community, we serve a community, we are not divorced from a community. And I think that that is one of the great lessons that I take home from discussions such as this. Thank you very much. announcement uh, this is uh, this is something that we can all we should all be cognizant of now, just this afternoon uh, mr pp rao who's who's a who's a great constitutional expert who has been a patron of our university uh, passed away so if we can if we can uh, observe a moment's silence in his memory then we can not go Thank you all. Second is one mark till seven. You want it done? 